All right, so um, there was an assignment from last meeting. I'll catch you up, and then we'll do the assignment. I want to get, I'm going to write down here. Collections of Suppose we have a planar algebra, right, with has these relations, then there was a theorem that we were going to try to prove. So in the old sense, not in the sort of generic sense, without the extra conditions put on to be coming from a subfactor, then the dimension of Pn of LR is finite. All right, so there in this audience, probably divided up into people who know this argument and people who didn't as of yesterday, two days ago. So. Anybody who, did anybody who doesn't know it want to say anything about thoughts? Have any thoughts? Okay, so so let's just sort of understand what the problem is. The problem is if, if I want to show, um, let's say, that P3 of LR is finite dimensional, right? I have all these three tangles that I can form. So I can form a big picture. Involving, I should choose one that actually. Oh. I'll draw one just that. I my notes, and I'm sort of leaving out orientation, but you know how it is. Okay. 
So this is an example of a three tangle. We could put any of the labeling of the labeling set. Set. Um, if PL of R is an exchange relation planar algebra, and I guess we need L equals L two. A finite set. Okay. So this is one example of a three tangle, right? But I can draw. I can stick boxes together, connect them up in all kinds of different ways. So you can see that. You know, here's another example of a three tangle, right? A very simple one. Here's another uh, simple one, let's say. It would be this one. Right? And but I can also make much more complicated ones by adding many, many more boxes. And since I can keep on going and adding more and more boxes, I'm gonna have to have some way of uh, showing that some of these things correspond to linear spans of other ones, otherwise this this algebra is not going to be finite dimensional. So that's the question. The question is, why is it that these relations are going to help me to reduce all kinds of pictures into other pictures and so that there are only a finite number of different pictures to think about? And so um, so the important concept here is the notion of um, I guess the notion of, of, of an area that's enclosed by boxes. Here's an example of an area. We'll call that an internal face. And so this only has one internal face. Uh, you mean this one? Yeah, I guess it has two internal faces. Sorry? And part of that internal face, if you take a look at what an internal face looks like, let's take this type of internal face. If you take just two of, if you just sort of circle this picture, part of the diagram, right? There's there's an internal face, right? And they're sort of that's not an internal face anymore because these are open-ended. But there's sort of two two boxes facing this area. And so if you look at that, you should be able to convince yourself that that's this picture where this is where the internal face is. If I sort of pick this picture up and rotate it around a little bit, I can match this picture up with the dotted diagram, with this piece of it ending up falling right in here. And so let's just try to figure out, so this is the location of the internal face. Let's figure out what this, so, and this is a relation, which means whenever I see this picture, I can write it as a linear combination of these pictures. So let's see what happens with that internal face, or just that, that area. That area. That area ends up being where? It's between the first strand and the second strand. So here, right, and yeah. here. Okay. And let's see what the important observation is, is that whereas this internal face saw two boxes, two different boxes, one, two, in this, on this side, it only sees one box in each of these pictures. Right? So that means that when I make this substitution, I write it as a linear combination of things. But what happens in here is that the two things that I saw end up seeing only one by the time I'm through. There's other stuff that happens, right? but the two that I saw end up being one. OK, so if I was to do that, right, I'd end up with a linear combination of all kinds of pictures with other stuff going on. Who knows what? But one of the things that they that would see was these two boxes ended up being replaced by a single box. Okay. So now I have an internal face with one small one less box. So now what do you think I should do? Well, now I have an internal face again has one less box in it. What did I do? I started with an internal face with four boxes. Now I've got an internal face with three boxes. I should do it again. Right? And now I look at maybe these two. Go use this relation. And I'll end up with an internal box with only, I'll end up with a sum of a bunch of things. But now I'll have an internal face with only two boxes, which looks like this. Now I can do it again, right? In the sense that the following picture, if I, this, this is a planar relation, right? So if I want to see a picture that has just, that 
an internal face with only two boxes. One way I can do it is by looping this to that. Right now it's an internal box with only two faces. And if I do that, if I loop that, that's by the this is a relation. Here's a tangle that I get from this relation that has part of it in it, which is looping off the bottom two. So I would loop here. And I would loop here. So I'd have a linear combination of these guys, right? Well, what does this have in it? It's got a box with a cat on it. So in fact, it's going to allow me to completely take away that box. Right? And it's going to allow me to completely take away this box. And what have I done is I've sort of proceeded along and I've removed in the end that, that internal face is gone. So you have to check that you don't introduce new faces while you're doing this process. But what it, what it is is that that internal face is gone. So I can, I can just proceed. I, each time I get a sum of more things, but each of those things in, in complexity in terms of the number of internal faces starts to reduce. Not more faces. Yeah. The number of faces. After I've done this process to completely annihilate the face, I have one less face in the picture than I had before. When you just argue on uh, boxes rather than faces, Okay, that, that yeah, seems that's much more compelling. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. If there's even a simpler argument. And it doesn't matter uh, which substitution you start with. Uh, no, no, because that's, that's, that's the statement of, of being a, you know, the plane of relations that pose that there's an equivalence between them. But that's, that's the modding out by that ideal of relation. Yeah, so you fix a face, so as Juan says, you fix a face, you annihilate it, right, and you have one less box. So we can keep doing that until we have, well, no internal faces, because as soon as we have no internal faces, we can't do this argument anymore. So now we have to sort of decide what are the pictures, how many pictures do we have left? Maybe with no internal faces, we still have an infinite number of pictures. But that turns out not to be the case. So if you want to do three, uh, well, if you want to do three boxes, let's see. So that's a, this is just a graph theoretic question, right? Which is that every time you have a box, it's a four valent vertex. Right? And you're going to have, so in the end, so any picture, let's see, this a picture like, well, let me just, I'll, perhaps I'll, instead of doing it, I'll sort of draw you the types of pictures that exist. This is an example of something that has no internal face. That's a three box. That is a three tangle. And there are rotated versions of this. So there's, uh, let me draw you another one. So another one would be, oh, yeah, probably all these guys, right? Yeah, OK. So these guys. Thank you. Saved me a lot of trouble. And so to argue in more dimensions, you do, it's just a graph. It's a, you know, vertices minus edges plus faces have to be constant, right? So the number of faces you know, you, you sort of bounded. So vertices correspond to the number of boxes. So, um, and so do edges. Sort of limited in that way. Um, Okay, so what is it? So this is that's the proof, right? So that's the proof that says this, these things are finite. Now there's no guarantee, right? So this is a relation that we can impose. We haven't said anything about the coefficients, and if we impose this relation, we know that we've taken this very infinite large thing and reduced it to something that's finite. There's no guarantee that it's not zero. Right? So as as what we say, if I make different choices, I may, may end up with new relations, and those new relations force everything to be zero. So um, so, so there's a question out there, which is, do do these things actually exist? And the answer is that they do. And so let me give you the first sort of so so I guess Temple Lieb is an example of this, where there are actually no two boxes other than one in E. You can show that those, in fact, is fine. Um, but let's do the first uh, sort of not obvious one, which is Fuchs-Catalan. 
linear algebra, which was introduced by Vaughn and Dietmar Beach. And um, so it describes, so, so here's the scenario that it comes from. And the scenario in subfactors that it comes from is suppose you have an intermediate subfactor between n and m. So this intermediate subfactor turns out the presence of this intermediate subfactor, there's a projection from m onto the, so if you look in L2 of m, there's the projection, so the basic construction has a projection from L2 of m to L2 of n, oh, sorry, to, to the image of n sitting in L2 of n, closure of that image. And that's E, 1. Right, which is the projection onto the image of, projection onto the image of, or this closure of, of n. But you're going to have another, if you have a, if you have a p here, there's, a, there's another projection, which is the projection onto the image of p. Let's call that projection P for now. And if you, if, you figure, if you sort of look at the projection, you'll find that it's an n prime intersect m1. So it's a two-box. Okay, so, it's in it, it, so P is an n prime intersect m1. And you can start to write down what the conditions are for P to correspond to an intermediate subfactor and um, for an existence of a projection P that corresponds to an intermediate subfactor. And so, I'm sorry? P, second line P. P? Yes. And then P here also. One's capital P, one's the Sorry. And they're both the cars. They're, they're meant to be the same letters. Fine, the same thing. Okay, so. Um, So there's sort of a uh, so there's a nice theory developed about what these p's look like, how you know what, are, what completely characterizes them. So if I, I know what n prime intersect m looks like, and I have a p, you know, and I can find a p with these things. That implies that there's actually an intermediate subfactor. And so, so um, Okay, so so let me um, so as it was originally presented, it wasn't completely clear that it was a, a, an exchange relation subfactor. But let me just write down what the exchange relations turned out to be. So it's just a simple modification of what we're actually a description. So these are the relations. If you turn the relations into pictures, these were the relations on P. This is the characterization of, of if you can find an object that has, yeah, if you can find an object that has these properties to them, okay, so this is the property that it's self adjoint, right, and the involution preserves it. This is the property that its expectation onto uh, M is a scalar. 
property that came from Como, never mind, from, from another characterization. So if you can find a P with these properties, it correspond, there, it tells you that there's an intermediate subfactor in the, in the, from the planar, there's, a, there's an intermediate subfactor in the inclusion of subfactors that you were talking about. And we can see right, so right away, right, this is, these, are, these are the exchange relations. Right? They call, they call, this is perhaps the simplest of an exchange relation because there's no linear combination. And I guess um, this is one point of view about the planar algebra, but there's another point of view in terms of a presentation of the planar algebra that's really quite pretty. And that's to think of, uh, of the following situation, which is which is where the Fuss Catalan algebras came from. Which was uh, so maybe I should contrast it with the Templi Lieb algebra. So let me remind you that the Templi Lieb planar algebra consisted of essentially boxes where for tangles, sorry, tangles. The edges on the top and the bottom are all just by lines with no boxes in them at all. That's the Templi Lieb algebra. Well, this Catalan algebra, <laughs> we can sort of start to say, here we allow everybody, to, each guy, to be connected to its neighbor. Right? So maybe we should impose some sorts of restrictions on this process. And one way to sort of describe, an, uh, one, way to, so one set of rules to make is to sort of label the, the ed, end points in the following way. And then it's only allow pictures where A's are connected to A's and B's are connected to B's. So, let's see if I can do this without messing up. Do that, that, for instance. Now, for if if I'm doing that now, my A's I have some choices for A. One thing I can't do is obviously is join this A to that A, but I could do say this one and that one. And now, uh, say we do that, and that, and that, and that. So this is an example of an element in this algebra. And multiplication, I would can stack these on top of each other. So um, I just need to tell you about sort of what a loop that's in A and a loop that's in B. These are going to be two different topics. And so I can sort of describe this algebra. This is called the Fuss Catalan algebra. And there's some really, there's really nice work analyzing the dimensions of these algebras and the structure of these algebras. But what is the connection to that, to this? Well, let me, let me tell you. The connection is the following. You take every strand in your planar algebra over here, and depending on its orientation, if it's oriented up, you split it into two strands and you label the left one A and the right one B. So sort of amount, you picture it as two strands. And so the only other thing I have to tell you is what P looks like in this picture. I'll tell you the P. And so P now has, coming into it, we picture it as A, B, B, A. And coming out at the bottom is A, B, B, A. because the upside down strand is BA. And so inside, the, I just have to tell you what looks like, like inside this picture. And inside this picture, there's only one guy that we haven't really actually covered yet, which is this one. And it's, a, it's not actually this, but it's a multiple of this. Okay. And so the identity, for instance, is all the lines straight down. And E, remember E that always existed, is this picture here, is, uh, which we, we of course know because we knew E before looked like this. This was E before. So now it has to look like
right. So if we're sort of trying, so, so this has a lot of rich structure, and the point is that it it in, it it, ha, it is has an a, uh, exchange relation structure. So this class of things have some choice of coefficients at least that we know of, and choice of boxes. This is it, we would have the labeling set being a single two box L two just the single element P. Right. Um, so we have an existence of some uh, exchange relation. So. Those aren't the only ones, but maybe it's important to stop here for a second and sort of, just for a second, to sort of understand what the, the approach is that we've taken here, right? So this is some sort of, uh, it's approach of sort of designing these things and, and sort of analyzing them. And, and it's certainly that argument that sort of reduced the number of faces or the number of options it was a skein theory kind of thing, right? It was a skein theory argument. And Ed Vaughn had, Eight lectures. I don't know. I think he planned on saying something about sort of other versions of this that are really, really pretty and nice. Um, but uh, as an approach to sort of the study of playgrounds, and I think studies of subfactors, and I think one could argue that this is, this is a real, this is really something that wouldn't have come out if you hadn't had real points of view on these stuff, right? Is, is this scheme theory type of approach and what it, and what, what it does. And are there, so who is it who's, should I mention some people? Some, no, but were the, so there were these, there were these, you were telling me about these arguments uh, involving bubbling up to the top and stuff like that, right? Well, it's the uh, bigger arms that go down to the other Yeah. Yeah, so there's some, there's some nice, um, so whereas for a while, skein relationships arguments always talked about reducing numbers of boxes or reducing something in even Bigelow's argument. Uh, sort of really novel because it doesn't involve reducing, it involves sort of counting something else, which is sort of a distance between something and something else, and sort of has this, at least there's a there's some notion of the jellyfish and things bubbling to the top. Is that sort of, is that accurate? Yeah. Okay. Okay. For now, in our wanderings, we're going to just sort of uh, stay with exchange relation planar algebra. And again, going to put you to work a little bit. I can. Um, to say that there's, what well, turned out to be at least somewhat surprising, was the theorem that said. All depth two. Irreducible subfactors. Are exchange relation. I have exchange relation planar algebra. So I have to tell you what depth two means. Any reducible, I guess. So irreducible means n prime intersect m is the scalar. There are no more boxes. And depth two means, remember everyone was describing the basic construction, the principal graph that comes from the basic construction. Basic construction. And depth two means that this all that you expect to get, remember how at each level you would get the basic construction plus possibly more stuff. Depth 2 means that after, depending on how you count, the first step or the, after the second step, you no longer get anything new. Okay. And that's encapsulated by this expression, that the n prime intersect n2, which is the three boxes, are spanned by things of the form n prime intersect m1, which is a two box, times e1 times n prime intersect. Okay. This is what you get out of the basic construction. This this is the chunk that you get, and that's all that you get. Nothing more. Okay.
let's continue with our sort of uh, with our scheme theoretic approach. Sort of sort of understand, make the argument that this is an exchange relation. Must be. Okay, so we're in good shape because this condition implies there are no one boxes. So that's good because we need the label set to just be two boxes. Right? And so let's take a look in pictures what this condition says. Right? So this condition says that all three boxes are in the span of things of this form. So let's write down what things of this form are. Have I labeled this E? I've labeled this E incorrectly. This is this should be the next E. That should be E2. Sorry. One of perhaps the negative aspects of thinking in pictures is I no longer have the ability to not think. It was only at the point when I had to draw this that I realized that I had made a mistake. Okay. Um, okay, so n prime intersect m2, right? That's three boxes. There's in the span of let's draw this picture. So this is something in n prime intersect m1. That's a two box, just sitting there like this, followed by e2. What does e2 look like? There's a scalar times this guy. E1 here, e2 is here, followed by another two box. So the equals anything right with three things coming in and three things coming out in particular in the span of that is for instance this three box right. this is an example of an element in m2 and prime intersect M2. So this can be written as a linear combination of these guys. Does that look familiar? Right. If you turn your head in a certain direction, you'll see this picture. Because otherwise you might have an infinite number of labels. Right. So let's just, let's set L2 equal a basis of equal correspond to a basis basis of n intersect m1. And we'll have the correspondence be exactly to the basis or basis or spanning set. I guess basis. <laughs> floating up. And Sorry. Okay, so right away we see that these, uh, these uh, depth two planar algebras from depth two are exchange relations. So now, all right, so what are the depth two planar algebras? Well, one of them we've seen, uh, we've sort of talked, no, I haven't, but everybody else has talked about group action. And one of these steps do come from the action of the action of group. So let me set up that situation. So you have a type 2 1 factor, M. And you think of it, and suppose you also are given an outer action. of a finite group G on it. And you have it Im implemented. Implemented by conjugation by unitaries. G. G. 
talk about n subfactor being the fixed point algebra of m. We talked about before. And so we have this conclusion. And m1 ends up being inside m1 ends up being the von Neumann closure of m along the g or that there's an item okay so and in particular M are the scalars, n prime intersect m1, just the unitaries that implement the group action. So the span of that. So the span of that. And E1, in terms of the group, can be written as. 1 over the order the average of these unitaries. The implementation of averaging over the unitaries is going to create um, and if you sort of take an element and you average over the unitary permutation of the finite group, you're going to get that. So you're going to get, get uh, something fixed by the, the action of the unitary group. So it'll end up being in it. Okay, so um, so, if, so that group action, if we want to think, we would, we would like to understand that as just the, what's going on as a planar algebra. And so we know it's an exchange relation planar algebra, but we don't know what these coefficients are. We don't know, you know, at the moment, we don't know these things. So let's, let's sort of put that all together and present it as planar algebra. Probably. Would you like to say something? <laughs> what about why? How was it originally shown? Well, but I mean, the 
You can build the principal gap up here, right? to be elements of G. Um, the star operation on the labeling set will be mapping G to G inverse. And then we get these relations. Just the loop is going to be the scalar root of G, the order of G. Again, the identity of the group will be what we call one before this. Just because of this, uh, I'll do this. This picture is going to be the same as a, a G upside down. And then there's one final relation. Sum of G. This condition here. One is the sum of the G's. So here's the exchange relation. This combined with this row is the exchange relation. There's some additive in here. That's the presentation of the. So let's just take it for just for a minute. Let's take a look at this relation. And if you ever were to want to manipulate it and use it, um, let me try to point out what remains constant in this picture. If you if you consider, a sh let's say, shade, the shaded region being these three, think of those as sort of rivers, and the G's as ridges. Okay. The point is that as you move from one picture to the next, if you start somewhere and float down the river, accumulate what you see as you go, that should stay the same. So for instance, if I float down this river this way, I just pick up a G. Okay. And in this picture I do, I also pick up a G. On the other hand, if I float down the river this way, and then turn, I pick up a G followed by an H. GH. And if I do that here, I pick up a GH. And finally, if I flow this way on the river, I pick up an H. If I flow this way, I pick up a G, but I'm going in the opposite. I'm going against the current. G's upside down, so that's a G inverse. Right? 
give a G inverse times GH, which is So if you'd like, you can then turn that into a presentation for the player algebra where instead of um, you end up labeling the strings, so you can replace a term manipulating these things or using them or thinking about them. There's, a, there's another description of this player algebra which says um, let's replace every time we see a G it uh, with orientation. Let's replace it by, uh, sorry, let's replace it by two, the two strands. And let's put something on the strands. And the what you put on the strands, I may have it backwards, but you put a G and you put a G inverse. And then you follow, so once I do that, if for any angle, let's say a zero tangle, replace every box with a picture like that. What I have left is I have a bunch of loops, and those loops have elements of the group acting on it. And you say that a, a single loop, you'll sort of see various elements. So you read off this word, and if that word is the identity, then you pick up a factor of order of g to the 1 half, and if that word is not the identity, it's 0. Angle 0. So that's an alternative description. Now you might ask yourself, what, so now you might ask yourself, what, what do, is there a nice presentation in this group structure, uh, in this group planar algebra, of, for instance, of, uh, what does, Uh, PK. Like. Okay. Turns out that you can, uh, using this presentation, you can describe PK in the following way as spanned by things of the form that look like this. Let's see. Make sure I write down the right ones. Maybe I didn't actually write them down. So let's see if I can figure it out. Uh, Depending on where you are at this point, it either looks like that. Or it can look like if the, if the number of guys is uh, even out here, then you throw in another box like this. And that, if you label, if you now cycle that over all the label, all the possible labels of the group element, group elements, you get an orthonormal, you get a orthogonal basis. I'm not, I don't quite remember whether it's normal. You can sort of see that if you glue two of them together, uh, well, it's sort of hard to see. But if you were to glue two of them together, you'd have this whole big picture all glued together with only strands coming out here. So those reduce rather quickly. So you sort of figure out what that reduces to in the remaining. Okay. So let's see. So uh, how are we doing So, the, so we've covered a few examples. So I, I guess maybe um, an additional thing to point out is that uh, depth two, so all depth two irreducible subfactors are exchange relations. I just showed you the one for the group case. Right, so uh, they're characterized all depth two by being actions of a Hopstar algebra. And um, so there the, uh, the description of the 
of the planar algebra gets a little more complicated, but not so bad. And uh, that's work done by and I. And um, here, I just let me just sort of uh, for those of you who don't, you know, for for who this, this is not a. notation for co-multiplication, then how does that correspond to a picture? It corresponds in a very lovely way to the following picture, at least lovely in my book, which is that this tangle is written as the linear combination over I. So that the co-multiplication of our algebra ends up being, if I have a box like this, I can, I can remove this one and replace it by two. So you see right here, right, that if I were to now stick a G over here on both of these, if I actually stick a G, what do I have left is an exchange relation, right? Corresponds to, oh, it's been erased. Corresponds to, this is our, this is our first example where instead of using just one coefficient that was non zero, there's a sum. Okay, and so let's see. So, what else should be mentioned here? So, so one thing to mention is, um, we were just point to, is Shramindra generalized this notion of exchange relation to. Um, not for two boxes, but for larger boxes. It's a very nice work. And just recently, um, a student of yours. Yeah. Um, I guess he hasn't published this yet. No. But has has characterized exchange relations with uh, uh, the dimension of n prime intersect and the dimension of n prime. Characterization of all exchange relations. Class describe yeah, classified. Subfactor, subfactor inclusion. And I think if if I understood those notes correctly, we so so here's a here's a I think an open question. Which is the exchange relation has uh, there is a linear combination of two different types of boxes, right? So, it's, so this picture, I forgot which way I, I drew them originally, but this picture is now a linear combination of pictures of, of pictures of the two different other versions. So a linear combination of a sum over here. Plus the third kind, which is this one. Put some coefficients in front, and that's the exchange relation. So, so the Fuchs Catalan had only one coefficient being non zero, right? As did the group. And in the Hopf case, it has a bunch of coefficients not being zero, but only in one of these two places. So as far as we know, as far as I know, um, there's no example of an exchange relation planar algebra that we know of where it's necessary to put in non zero coefficients. And it's, per it's conceivable that such a thing is ruled out for reasons that I've never been able to see good reasons for Is there, is there any example where there's no intermediate? 
It was it was all it was free product things, right? Free product things. Yeah. So. Well, that has, that is an example of something that doesn't have a, yeah, right. That doesn't have a new meaning, so thank you. Okay. Is that clock accurate? Okay. So we have a choice now. We can, what I prefer to do is move on to quantum stuff. Um, we could spend a little more time on exchange relation planar algebras, but let's not, unless somebody has a serious objection to that. Uh, okay. Okay. So I think this, this requires a clean board. The speed introduction. We're gonna, so, let me sort of remind you of sort of where where we started and why we're heading in this direction. Okay, so, we started with this idea that these, um, as a as a way for revealing insight and for doing computation, the sort of pictures are important. And so we started with the notion of tensor networks, which we'll come back to in, in computation. We've moved on to to planar algebras where and saw them sitting there. Now we're going to sort of go back to, um, or we're going to go to, we're, we're going to move to a sort of different, different setup. And so let me sort of tell you what this setup is, because it's a sort of, at least for me, uh, when, uh, okay, the quantum computation. What, 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 what's the basic idea here? Well, the basic idea is the following. So if you think of, um, if you think of a scale. That you weigh yourself on, right? So that's you can think of that as some sort of computational device. Right? Okay, all right, sorry. Um, <laughs> right. Um, okay, if you think of a balance, <laughs> better. Okay, your balance is a computational device where you have maybe some weights on the one side and you're trying to weigh something else, right? So, um, is that is that okay? <laughs> um, if you think about what. Okay, so so this is a device. It's some sort of thing. It computes something. It computes the weight or it allows you to calculate the weight. And what does it rely on? Right? What it relies on is the physical principle of gravity. Right? And the notion that at least in a balanced case, gravity is going to act the same with the same force on the left and the right. right? And so that I can sort of do, do this kind of thing. Or in the case of a scale, that gravity over here and gravity somewhere else is the same. Right? So there's sort of this physical principle of gravity. And if you think of the old style non-electric cash registers, for instance, right? To, you know, the ones where you had to sort of do that too, maybe, maybe you sort of type things in and you do that. So what is that's that's a computational device, does addition and some sort of multiplication perfectly well. And what's going on there? Well, some somehow inside that thing magically is a bunch of cogs. 
that are moving around every time you press something. But what it's relying on in terms of physical principles is it's relying on mechanics, right? If I move this cog in some direction, it's going to push this other cog, and every time I do that, the same thing is going to happen, right? So something's going to move to something else. And, and once I understand those, how those things move around, I sort of very intuitive. Once I understand those, then I can start to try to think of something that does something interesting and, and, and use that those principles for computing. If you think of, you know, modern day computers, at their core, if you just look at what they are, they run on electricity and magnetism, right? So what's going on on a circuit board is that via it, that electricity is being routed around using the principles of electricity and magnetism, and people have been very cleverly figured out transistor to sort of do that, which implements a gate, and then sort of to design these things to put them together. But what you've got in the end is a computation based on the physical principles of electricity and magnetism. And mechanics in the sense that you, well, there are various other things, but, um, but it, at the core is electricity and magnetism. So um, so Feynman, at some point, sort of said, well, what, there are other physical principles in the world, right? And so he's, so he's focused on quantum mechanics, right? So quantum mechanics describe how tiny, or we believe that quantum mechanics describes how tiny particles interact, right? So there are these tiny interactions that aren't covered by other physical principles. And the question is, OK, let's use those as a building block for computation. Let's design those as your basic maneuvers and ask ourselves, let's try to build something out of that. So you can sort of ask the question, can I physically control these interactions in a way that makes sense? But you can, so that's the kind of akin to saying, you know, can I build a circuit board? But you can ask the other question, right? Which is, suppose I could, what would it be good for? What can I do that I can't already do? What could I do to change that I can't already do? Now certainly, you know, we don't know with mechanics, uh, it's pretty hard to imagine that using gravity and mechanics, you could reproduce what a computer does, right, without electricity. So, so, so the idea of quantum computation, right, or so the, this whole field, is focused on if you start with the idea that quantum mechanics is what you can do, and that let's just hypothesize that we can control those interactions, then what is it good for? What can we make it good for? What can we do? So once you take that point of view, right, so what we need to do, if, if you want to sort of ask that or a helpful thing to do, is to sort of abstract away all of quantum mechanics and just sort of end up with a set of rules, just like that you do with uh, electricity and magnetism. You just end up with and or, and and or gates, and you sort of just sort of say, start to go, or a Turing machine, however you want to sort of say what it is that you want to do. You can sort of describe the basic idea of what, what your computational device is, and then sort of ask what kinds of questions can it answer. So here I have why, I mean, how do you have any idea that you couldn't use quantum mechanics in a completely different, maybe more clever way to come up with some things not based on the gates? You said there's a sort of mechanism that you can't do gravity and mechanics, but you do that, you say, well, that's not proof. No, but if you start with the if you start with the basic principles of mechanics, then you can ask what you can do with that. I didn't say you you know it seems hard to imagine, but nobody says you you can't. But if you assume the basic principles of, of mechanics, you're not excluding the possibility. Well, we're just describing. I mean, in the end, it's a it's a description of what quantum mechanics. A description of what these machines that you're going to tell us about can do. No reason why quantum mechanics shouldn't be able to do what they're doing. You do it with different machines. There's always been one way to So I, I'm not sure that that's actually true, right? Because because you have a description, a model of quantum mechanics, which is a model of how you think. Okay. Okay. So we have a little work to do, but here's where we start. So we're going to start with a bi-dimensional Hilbert space. 
are the ingredients that go in. And then let me sort of tell you about the various things that we have, and the, the sort of there are things that are called states, which what we mean by states is unit vectors. Tensor product of n. We have the notion of a local unitary. The local unitary will be. So I guess I should say that it will be unitary operators. Unitary operator. Unitary operators on some small number of copies of H, some fixed finite number of copies of H, and it turns out that if we want to sort of expand things out, it, 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 all we need is this a bunch of unitaries, on, local unitaries on, on two copies of H. Okay, and then we have an idea of a local measurement. by the ingredients that go into a local measurement, and I'll tell you more about all these things. So, uh, <coughs> you think seven and then? yeah, so for the, so I guess in terms of just sort of nomenclature, states will be considered to be norm one vectors, and there'll be somewhere, there'll be some Hilbert space lying around of some number of copies of H. In, once we sort of start to talk about particular things, we're going to fix. So we have a local measurement, which is, um, well, what does that mean? It's just a, it's, it's just a, a decomposition of the identity with projections. So the sum of the PIs is going to be the identity. And these are, sorry, these are projections on H. So I guess they're K of them. If we, Actually, they can be less than K. We can, we can, we don't need to be rank one. There are no more than K to be the identity. Okay, so now I'm going to raise Vaughn's ire by sort of describing a model for. Um, for a quantum computer or quantum computational. Okay. So now we are going to fix, well first we're going to fix a basis, we're going to fix a basis for H. So let's call that basis, let's say, E0, K. Okay, and so here's, here's what Here's what we will think of as a quantum computation. So maybe I should go. Yeah. What's that? So PIs are projections or positives? Oh, yeah, sorry. PIs are projections. So we're going to start with E0 tensor E0. So we're going to, uh, so we're going to fix it N. So we're going to sort of be acting in a space in this tensor product H N copies of H. So we're going to start with the very simple vector state E0 tensored with itself a whole bunch of times. And then we're going to apply a sequence of local unitaries. Let's say u1, u2, 
U3. So let's, let's see what, what I mean by that, right? So local unitaries are unitaries in this case. They're acting on two copies of H. And in this case, we're going to, um, so it's another norm one vector. And now at the end, we get to measure. And let me tell you what measure means. Measure with respect. So, in your in your measurement, you have sitting around p1 through pl, and it's on. These are projections on some h. So we're going to sort of it's sitting. It's going to be projections on one of these copies. And just for convenience, just think about it as to be the first copy, that we don't have to. And when you measure. Here's, what you, here's the information you get out. Okay. The output of the measurement is one of these numbers, 1 through L, is a number, an integer, 1 through L. Okay. You get a second thing, which is a normalized uh, State, so it's sorry, the state. We get the state So if sorry, if if the number was I, you get the normalized state P I W over the norm of P I W. So these are the things you get coming out. You get that and you get this with probability. I should, sorry, each, each u is a local operator, and then in this case, so I've been a little bit sloppy, but u1 would be some local operator, by, but then I should tell you which two copies of h in h tensor h to the n that it's operating on. So think of each of these u's as being something that acts non trivially on two copies and, and as the identity on the rest. And I've specified which one. And PI, so the PI is all, I'm going to fix one local, yeah, there's one copy of H, but all the P's are acting on the same copy of H. So let's just actually just make it the first copy of H. Because we, we could always move things around by unitary switching to make it the first. Well, the, the local unitary supposed to act on the system? They don't have to in, this, in, the, in the generic model. In the end, when you start talking about circuits, you tend to use an assumption that they are. A generic thing. So I'll, at some point, I'll transition so that they're local and neighbors. But, but it's sufficient to think of them as neighbors. So you, it's sufficient to think of the. Oh, you only need to restrict yourself to the class. There. Yeah. So so a unitary flip can do that. Right. So so you know that's right. right. If you wanted to act on two ones that were far away, right. You'd sort of move, you could take this one, flip, you just use the unitary that flips them to get it close, act on the unitary, and then move it back around if you wanted to sort of do everything locally. But at a cost, that would be a cost. At a cost, which is important. OK. OK, so, so, let, me, so let me stress, so let's sort of go back over this again, OK? Because this is, this is all new stuff. It's rather confusing. but. Um, you stuck, yeah. So I didn't quite. What would it make a number one to p? Yeah, one to l. So when you do a measurement, or when you measure, you measure according to a set of projections that add up to the identity, and that's just an action that you do. And the outcome of that action is one of l different vectors 
these guys, along with knowledge of which I it was, is this. And this happens when you say measure. It's like flipping a kind of probabilistic, it's a probabilistic event. It'll happen, the i measurement will happen with probability proportional to the norm. So the, proportional to the norm squared, so the amount of the vector in the direction of that subspace corresponding to pi. Right, so, so w right, splits up into, we can decompose w as pieces sitting in each of these, the ranges of each of these projections. Right? They're orthogonal pieces. The sum of the squares there in each of those pieces is 1. And you get the output of one of those pieces with probability proportional to the squared. OK, so here's the important thing to, to understand, which is in this model, you do not get to ask arbitrary questions about w. Okay. I don't know w at all. w is in the background. I don't know it. The only thing that I can know about w is by a result of a measurement. So let me sort of say, you can't look at w in the normal sense of the word. I can't get you, you can't sort of know the coefficients that w things, you can't expand it in a basis, you can't do any of that stuff. The only thing that you can do is anything that you can do is structured in terms of a measure. Okay, so Change with a certain probability. That's right. Okay. All right. So I guess I'm going to, uh, I'll sort of restart next time. But let me just sort of say so now, what, so with this, uh, what is it that we're sort of now asking ourselves? What we're asking ourselves is, Assume that every, you know, every, so what I'm at, what we're asking is, we start with the states that we know. Then we're allowed to apply these unitaries. So I can pick unitaries specially designed. And in the end, I, I can do this for some amount of time, counting some number of steps. And then eventually I do a measurement and I get out some information. And so the question is, can this be used? Can I, by choice of my unitaries and my measurement? Can this be used to answer interesting questions? So the, the first thing to say is that, and so what is it that, um, what is, how are we going to sort of, in what sense is, so there's something about number of steps that we have to talk about. And the number of steps is just going to be the number of unitaries that you have to use. And so I can talk about a polynomial time type algorithm, which would be something that I'm allowed to use the number of unitaries that are polynomial in N. So I can ask my, the restricted question, which is what, you know, what kind of problem can I solve that depend on N, you know, um, but that in polynomial with a polynomial number of unitaries, and then a measurement, I can do something interesting. In the same way that you can ask that question for a classical computer. Right? You can say, what kinds of problems classically on a regular computer can I take a polynomial number of steps, or polynomial time, um, to solve. So that's the basic form, uh, sort of framework for, for quantum computation, for quantum algorithms. And I guess the first thing that is totally apparent is that you can do anything at all. But it turns out that you can prove quite easily, and we, you know, we'll sort of set it up. Maybe, maybe we won't do it, but or we'll just gloss over it. Is you can do everything a well, I guess I can say a few words. But you can do anything a classical computer can do, you can do. I mean, so you can, the reason that is, is you can think of a class, you can just restrict your unitaries to only ones that sort of uh, 
operate that, that do very basic things like keep everything basis states. Right? So you can think of E0, this tensor product of E zeros is just the bit string all zeros. And if I restrict my unitaries to just ones that do things like flip bits from zero to one or or add bits or do anything like that, which are which will map my bits to a you know, I can use the fits, I can map the fits, that's a very restrictive class of unitaries, and that's going to model what a, a classical computer does. So anyway, so that's the setup. Right? Now, okay, it's a little bit intimidating, but don't panic, right? Because what we're going to do the next, probably the next thing, is to see that what quantum computation is, is it's just an evaluation of a tensor network. Okay. So it's just an approximate, uh, it's actually to say, sorry, to say it better, it's just the approximation of a tensor network. And so if you want to design quantum algorithms, you don't have to understand any of this. Right? All you have to do is sort of start looking at tensor networks and understand designing tensor networks that solve this. That gives you something interesting that you want to know and making sure that the way you've done it, the, the level of approximation you're getting is reasonable for being able to answer some questions that you want to know. So, a lot of the focus of, of the next few days will be on that, but it'll also be on once you take that point of view and you see quantum computation in terms of tensor networks, what are the, we'll sort of wander through the other kinds of realizations that are not apparent if you were to sort of, they're sort of much more apparent in this, in this situation.